So um, we're going to sort of start gently. I'm going to sort of try to recall basic facts about um, Fuchsian groups and about uh, Teichmuller space in a, in a way which sort of sets us up to think about Anasov representations. Ah, so this is the overview, um, which I basically said. But you sort of, you know, you can study representations in a PSL2R, and then it's fairly obvious how you might try to abstract those things to study representations into isomic groups of other hyperbolic spaces. We, if we're going to, want to be fancy, instead of calling them isometry groups of other hyperbolic spaces, we call them rank one Lie groups. And then higher Teichmuller theory attempts to sort of generalize these techniques into the setting of higher rank Lie groups, where things get a little bit trickier. And um, the real reason they get tricky is that the when you look at the uh, these Lie groups are again uh, isometry groups of manifolds. But the manifolds they're isometry groups of are no longer negatively curved. They're only non-positively curved. And that causes us a fair, some amount of trouble. OK. Oops. OK, so I feel like I should start by uh, you know, defining H2 for you. But I won't. <laughs> so we're going to call a representation of pi 1 of s into PSLR, into PSL2R Fuchsian if it's discrete and faithful. And if you have a discrete faithful representation, then you can form a quotient uh, surface. So maybe, uh, you know, here's your naked topological surface S over here. And then you form your quotient N sub rho. And this is H2 modded out by rho of pi 1 of S. And then Rho gives you an identification of the fundamental group of this surface with the fundamental group of that surface. So then that gives you a homotopy equivalence. Um, and, and it gives you, in fact, a homotopy class of homotopy equivalence. But because these are just surfaces, every homotopy equivalence is homotopic to a homeomorphism. So in fact, we get a homeomorphism. OK, but we, I want to sort of. Uh, look at this from a different viewpoint. I want to uh, now, so John talked about not liking differentiation. I'm going to talk about a viewpoint where we don't even like continuity. So <laughs> sort of talk about Fuchsian groups from the coarse geometry viewpoint. So one basic point from that is that if you have one of these Fuchsian groups, then that gives you a quasi-isometry from the group into H2. Uh, and you construct that quasi-isometry. So maybe this is made from, so over here you have, um, well, what's the picture I want to draw? So over here you have the fundamental group of the surface, which we can uh, think of as, maybe I won't even try to draw that. So we're over here in H2, and we have a tessellation of H2 by maybe these octagons. And then we draw sort of a dual graph to that tessellation. And there's one vertex for every copy of the fundamental domain. And we're going to think of that as just a copy of the Cayley graph sitting within H2, or in fact, a copy of the group sitting within H2. And then we want to think of this representation as giving rise to a uh, quasi-isometry from the group into H2, which given, you just take a group element, you pick a base point here, this is x0, and you identify the group element with the orbit point gamma of x0. OK, so well, for this to make sense, <laughs> pi 1 of s needs a metric. So for those of you who haven't seen that before, the natural metric that you put on a group is the word metric. So that means for you choose some generating set. So there's you know a whole family of metrics on your group, um, and then you talk about the distance between the identity word and some other word. It's just the minimal word length of that representative, and the distance between two words gamma one gamma two is just the minimal word length of a representative of gamma one gamma two inverse, and so a way we. Is this the, uh, okay, 
<laughs> we often think of this uh, in terms of the Cayley graph. So what we would do, so let's do the Cayley graph for the free group, for instance. We put a vertex for one, and we go out here, over here's A, over here's A inverse, here's B, here's B inverse, and then we get there's A, B, there's A, B inverse, there's A squared, there's B, A, and you know, you just keep going forever. So you can think of there actually being a graph associated to your group where each edge corresponds to multiplying by a generator, and then the, the natural metric on that graph where you give every edge of length one induces the word metric on the group. So what I've really drawn, or not really drawn, but sort of indicated here was I've, I've tried to stick sort of the Cayley graph inside here. Okay. So now we've got a metric. Now what does it mean to be a quasi-isometry? Well, a quasi-isometry is sort of like an isometry if you have bad eyesight. So the first thing you might do to worsen, an isometry means distances are preserved. And the one thing you might say to loosen up that notion is you might go from isometry to by Lipschitz. You don't care up to a factor of k. So you might say the distance between, x, between f of x and x of y is between k times the distance of x of y and 1 over k times the distance of x of y. But then we don't really care what's happening locally at all, and we're going to, in fact, allow ourselves an additive constant of error. So we really don't care. We just care that in the large, and that as you make progress in x, if you map over into y, then you're making you know, similar amount of progress in y, or sort of comparable progress in y in the large. So the most basic example you can think of this is if you look at and you include z inside r, just as the integers, and that's a quasi-isometry. And here, uh, it's, um, well, in one, in one direction, it's, <laughs> so this direction is, in fact, an isometric embedding. But in fact, if we also go backwards and we just map any point to the least integer, say, above it, then that map is a quasi-isometry in other direction. Sort of the, it's constant, it's multiplic constant would be 1, and it's additive constant would also be 1. Okay, but you might also say, if you look at R2, what does R2 look like? R2 looks a lot like the group Z2, right? So this is the Cayley graph. Graph paper is the Cayley graph of Z2 and its inclusion into Euclidean space. Okay, so this is sort of, now we're hopping that up into the hyperbolic world where we look at the Cayley graph of the surface group and we've embedded it inside H2 quasi-isometrically. And so there's a general principle at work here, which is called the milner schwarz inequality, which says that whenever you have a group acting properly, properly and co-compactly on some reasonable metric space, um, then you in fact get a quasi-isometry between the group and the metric space. Okay? So here we see that Z is quasi-isometric to R. Here we see that Z2 is quasi-isometric to R2. And over here is supposed to be a picture of the fundamental group of a closed surface is quasi-isometric to the hyperbolic plane. Okay? And what's the, the basic idea is, well, you just take this orbit map. If you have gamma acting on your, your space X, well, here we go. So now this is no longer H2, this is X. This has changed its stripes. <laughs> and you have some nice action by isometries. There's, here's you pick some base point X naught, and there's gamma of X naught, and say, it's gamma 1 of x naught, that's gamma 2 of x naught, gamma 3 of x naught, and that gives you an embedding of the group into here. Why do you know that that's a... So this is, gets you, you can extend it, in fact, to this map of the 
Cayley graph into there. Now, why, why do you think that should be a quasi-isometry? For one thing, these edges all have the same length. And this is just the, the amount x naught is moved by any generator. There's some maximum value of that. And each of these edges is at most that length. Is at most the maximal movement of x naught by a generator. So right away, this map, if you just take what I choose, I chose k to be the maximum that x naught is moved by any generator. And then right away, this map is k Lipschitz. So you have one direction in the quasi-isometry. And what do we need to know um, for the other direction? We need to know that as you, um, that if you take a word of big length, then, in fact, its orbit is far from the origin. Right? So that's roughly proper discontinuity, said that vaguely. But we also want sort of linear progress away from the origin. So what do, what do we do? So if we take any orbit point over here, some general point gamma of x naught, and we sort of join it to, the, to x naught by a path, well, if you look at the diameter of the quotient object, it's at most some number, we'll call that c, which means that as you travel along this, you first divide this path into segments of size c, and then at each point here, you pick an orbit point. So here you're going to pick, um, maybe this orbit point is called gamma 1 x naught. This is gamma 2 x naught. This is gamma 3 x naught, gamma 4 x naught, et cetera. And so you can see that if you divide this into five segments, then each of these segments you can find a nearby orbit point, and the distance in the group between x naught and gamma 1 of x naught is some number. These, these orbit points are at most, well, 3c apart, 1c, 2c, 3c apart. And since this action is properly discontinuous, there's only a finite number of group elements within 3c of the origin. So each element, each um, pair of orbit points, which differ by at most 3c, differ by at most some bounded number of generators. So then I can take this little segment of size c, which goes from here to here. I can do that in a bounded number of generators. I call that R1. And then I can get from gamma 1 to gamma 2 by R1. I can get gamma 2 to gamma 3 by at most R1, and gamma 3 to gamma 4 by most R1, et cetera. So I know that that tells me that if my orbit point is not very far from my base point, then in fact the word length of my element is not very large. This is sort of a very general principle in geometric group theory. Okay, And one application of that principle is that when you have a Fuchsian representation that uh, the orbit map is a quasi-isometry. Okay. So what's the second key property of Fuchsian representations? Well, one of them is that when you wiggle a Fuchsian representation a little bit, it remains a Fuchsian representation. Right? We know that uh, we saw in Francois' talk that a Fuchsian representation is an entire component of the, of the uh, representation variety. Okay, so what's the sort of a general way of seeing this? Um, well, if you take a quasi-isometric embedding into, a hyperbolic, into, hyperbol into the hyperbolic plane and you wiggle it a little bit, it remains a quasi-isometric embedding. And if something is a quasi-isometric embed, if, a represent, if the orbit map of a quasi-isometric embedding is a quasi, if the orbit map of a representation is a quasi-isometric embedding, then in fact that representation must be degree, discrete and faithful, because you can't have an infinite order element uh, which fixes a point, because that would not then the orbit point, the orbit map would be. Bing, 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 you know, stay there. And uh, uh, you also can't have a very large number of orbit points near the origin. So you have to be discrete. Okay. Um, 
So what does this follow from? This is a basic fact about hyperbolic space, which is that if in hyperbolic space, on every segment of length 50 miles, you make definite progress, then you make definite progress over your entire uh, time. So if you're traveling for a million hours, and in, over every segment of 100 hours, you make definite progress, then over the entire segment of a million hours, you make definite progress. Now notice this is very much not true in Euclidean space. Right, because what could you be doing in Euclidean space? So in Euclidean space, you could be traveling around the circle. So this is no, not a boundary of H2. This is a circle in the Euclidean plane now. And if you look at it, if you look locally, if you take a very large circle, if you look sort of locally, it looks like you're traveling along a line. This is a... Uh, this is calculus. This is all. <laughs> this is, you know. This is what we spend an entire semester teaching our students, right? That if you uh, that locally, uh, locally you look like your tangent line. So, and so if you uh, so no matter how uh, what a, what how long a time frame you measure and see that you look like you're making definite progress, you could be circling around and coming back home. You could you could just be on a very large circle. So why can't you do that for hyperbolic Right. Um, so right. So what happens in, in the? Uh, so this is sort of a. Um, I was trying to figure out what to do with this. I don't want to do a whole, <laughs> a whole class on uh, hyperbolic trigonometry. <laughs> so, but, but we know that in hyperbolic space, that if we walk a hundred feet and we make a right angle, and we walk another 100 feet, and we make a right angle, and we walk another 100 feet, and we make a right angle, and we walk another 100 feet, and we make a right angle, about how far will we be from home? Almost 400 feet, right? I mean, <laughs> the hyperbolic plane, um, right, so there's this, uh, right, there's this, there's this calculation I like to do to illustrate uh, how bad the hyperbolic plane is. So, I mean, suppose you're golfing and you're 100 yards from the hole, which we'll think of as 300 feet, and you hit a shot which is only one degree off. Okay? How far, so in, in Euclidean space, you're about five feet from the hole. Because you can just do that by, well, you're like 300 uh, times 2 pi divided by 360. Pretty good estimate, you get about five. So if you do this calculation in hyperbole, what? Yeah, so what happens in hyperbolic space? I mean, I've drawn this picture, but Actually, how far are you from the hole? You're, 500, you're over 590 feet from the hole. So even if you walk 300 feet in hyperbolic space, turn around, go nearly backwards, you know, you turn at a 179-degree at angle and head nearly backwards, you'll end up like 590 feet from home. So it's that, it's that same basic principle. You made definite progress. <laughs> Okay. Another thing, this is, and this is also true in any sort of so-called hyperbolic metric space. And the basic guy, one basic idea, of, a way of saying this, is that if you take a, a quasi a map which is making definite progress, so you're one of these so-called quasi GD six. Well, what happens in hyperbolic space is you fellow travel the GD six. So if you're going from x to y. And you make sort of, you know, KC quasi-isometric quasi progress. So you're sort of wandering, but you're making definite progress and definite time. Then you have to have stayed near the, the, the in fact, the, the most efficient possible path. But what happens in Euclidean space is that if you're going a long distance from X to Y, this is in Euclidean space, you could go up here and then over. And that is a square root of two quasi-isometry. Right. On the other hand, it's got him super far away. 
So you can never tell locally what happens. So here, you can imagine you're trying to go from x to y. You're trying to travel along this GD sec. And, you know, so suppose um, you didn't make good progress. Well, that would mean that at some point you, get you have to get very far away and then turn back. And then if you look at this, there's some place where you were very inefficient in doing so. So if you look at the standard proof of the fellow traveler property, it sort of contains this. And why do I only need, I said I only have to look about the ball of radius L about the identity. Well, what's the nice thing about this orbit map? It looks the same at every point, right? Because this is an equivariant picture, so that if I move, um, if I look at what the image of my Cayley graph looks like near the identity, and I move to any old orbit point over here, you know, then it looks the same. If I go along a generator here, I have the exact same looking picture. It's an equivariant picture. So that means that if I'm a quasi-isometry on the ball of radius L about the origin, I'm a quasi-isometry on every ball of radius L. So if I want to see what's happening in the graph, in the whole Cayley graph, I know that if I'm traveling point X to point Y, that locally I'm always making good progress, so globally I'm always making good progress. So if you think about what that means for a representation, if you move your representation a very small amount, that means every generator gets moved a very small amount, which means that every orbit point gets moved a small amount. Now, of course, the problem is that an orbit point, which is a million generations away, gets moved a million times small. But a million times small could be big. Um, but this says that, well, I only need to check. There's some radius L, which is a million, and say if I control a million, a million translates, then I'm done. And if, and if I always want all the million translates to be within one of what they were before, I just have to adjust each um, generator so that it's very, very close to my original choice of generator. So that tells me that if I wiggle it just a little bit, then I wiggle it, I wiggle the orbit, I wiggle the representation a little bit, I wiggle the orbit map a little bit, and um, since I only need to look at it on a ball of radius a million, I can wiggle it so little that on the ball of radius a million it's still very well behaved. Okay. So that's why that if you, if you take something which is a quasi-isometric embedding and you wiggle a little bit, it remains a quasi-isometric embedding. And this works, this same proof works in every, uh, if you have a representation of the isometry group of any negatively curved space. You can make this exact same space. So in fact, any sort of hyperbolic space, this will work. Okay. So what about Teichner space? So I think... Francois defined Teichmuller space in a slightly different way, but I want to think of Teichmuller space as a space of representations, not as a space of surfaces. So what he said was that a point in Teichmuller space so here's what here was Francois's picture. He has a point in space in Teichmuller space, I have my naked surface S, and I put a metric on it. Well, okay, how does that give me a representation? Why is that a representation? I can instead think of, here I've got my naked surface S, and over here I've got my hyperbolic surface X, which is S with the metric M, and I have a homeomorphism. And I have a homeomorphism H from S to here. Now, X is equal to H2 modded out by gamma, where gamma is contained in the group of orientation-preserving isometries of H2, which I can think of as PSL2R. So now when I look at H, now H star gives me a map from pi 1 of S to pi 1 of x 
But pi 1 of x is just its group of trans covering transformations, which is gamma, and gamma is sitting inside PSL2R. Okay? So that's how you can sort of go from a space of metrics to a space of representations. As I wiggle the metric here, then I wiggle the group of covering transformations, and hence I wiggle this representation. Okay? And, oh, I missed out. There's, that's supposed to be modded out. This x means I've modded out by PSL2R. Because obviously if I take a representation and I conjugate it by PSL2R, then I have the exact same quotient surface. And that really would just mean that, you know, for instance, I can write this as H2 mod gamma, and that means I've chosen some point on the surface, say y naught, and it lifts to some fixed point x naught up in H2. But then if I move and I say I want this point over here, y1, to lift up to x naught, what happens? I conjugate the representation. So it's like just choosing a base point on the surface. And we don't really want to care about what base point we choose on the surface. We only want to care about the conjugacy class of the representation. Okay? And so what Francois said, I don't think he said it in exactly these words, is that Teichner space is a component of the space of representations. And it's isomorphic to R, 6G minus 6. Oh, that's calligraphic R, not math, BBR. Okay. And just to remind you, he had these Fenchel Nielsen coordinates, which are you took a pair of pants decomposition of your surface into three curves. And then one coordinate was the length of that curve. Another coordinate was the length of that curve. The third coordinate was the length of that curve. And then he showed that you can build a pair of pants with L1, L, with links L1, L2, and L3. And you build another pair of pants with length L1, L2, and L3. And then you just glue them together. Okay? But these are GD6, and there's lots of ways to glue them. You can glue them with a twist. And why do you get a real number? Um, well, as you think about this surface as sort of clothing being worn by the surface. So if, as I twist around, you know, I twist around, my clothing is different. You know, I can only twist so far. So I, you know, if, and if I wore my clothing twisted around three times, it'd be quite uncomfortable, right? So it really would be different. It's, 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 you know, I say like, you know, as you think about it, it's like, you think about this as, this is an imperfect analogy because there's no topology. But think about uh, those like children's, uh, children's, children's PJs with booties. Now, now it's the same clothing, but if you put the, the uh, PJs on the children and you've twisted the foot around three times, they will scream. It's the same clothing. They're not going to experience it the same way. It's, so it's, <laughs> it's not just the clothing, it's how you wear them. This is a... We're all fashionistas now. <laughs> so this is one way to think about the twist. Okay, and so we've already seen that Teichner space is open in this, in this representation variety. Why is it closed? Well, this is sort of a basic fact called the Margulis lemma, which says that if you have a limit of discrete faithful representations, then that limit is, is also discrete and faithful. So I won't go into that, but let me just tell you that's a basic and not terribly hard Lie groups fact which is uh, very general. So you may have seen this in the, uh, in the form of Jorgensen's inequality, which is just a quantitative form of the Margulis lemma. OK. So you might start generalizing to this what, what I would call somewhat higher Teichner theory. You know, I mean, this, this higher Teichner theory language is not too flattering for those of us who've spent all their life working in rank one. Um, we suggest we've all been doing lower Teichner theory the entire time. And, you know, actually, at my office, I, on one side, on one, on my office is right between Ralph Spatsier and um, Gopal Prasad's office. And I sort of figure they've been thinking to themselves, Dick, 20 years, two Lee groups. Come on. So I've been trying to impress them by expanding the number of Lee groups I can work in. Um, 
But, but you can expand a lot of what we've just said into, into a rank one Lie group. Well, what is a rank, rank one Lie group? Well, we take one of these comple real complex quaternionic or octionic hyperbolic spaces, and we take its isometry group. So up to passage to, to covers, that's just what a rank one Lie group is. It's like, well, you could just say, you know, like the isometry group of H2 is PSL2R. Well, but then there's also SL2R, but that's just an index two cover. So up to covering space theory, these are the same thing. And then if we have some, uh, and all my groups can be torsion free because torsion is kind of irritating and not to the point. It doesn't make any difference in anything we're doing. So all our groups can be torsion free. We can say a group is, is convex co-compact if the orbit map is a quasi-isometric embedding. So I look at my representation and I just look at what I pick a base point in my a hyperbolic space, and I move it around by the image of the representation, and I see, ah, did that give me a quasi-isometric embedding of my group? And if it does, I'm going to call that representation convex co-compact. And as we said before, if your orbits make definite progress, then you certainly have to be discrete, because if you're indiscrete, there's going to be orbit points arbitrarily close to the identity. <laughs> and, um, if you're, it also has to be faithful because if you're not faithful, then you have some infinite order element which doesn't move the base point at all. <laughs> so that then have infinitely many, infinitely, so the base point is infinitely many orbits of itself, which is very far from being a quasi-isometric embedding. Okay? And moreover, this argument I gave you that if you take a, a quasi-isometric embedding, and you wiggle it a little bit, it remains a quasi-isometric embedding. That works in any hyperbolic space, not just in H2. And in fact, it, it works in any space with curvature bounded away from zero, bounded above and away from zero in any reasonable sense you want to make it. So cat minus one spaces is a very general argument. So if you take a neighborhood of your quasi-isometric embedding in your rank one Lie group, all the nearby representations are convex co-compact. So that's a pretty good property. So that's what a property we're going to want. Ooh, I'm speaking of being slow. Um, that's a property we're going to want to have of a, if we're going to think of what's a good representation into higher rank, rank Lie groups. Well, there's some cautionary tales here. So this Teichner space, well, this was super nice because it was not only an open set of representations, it was also a closed set of representations. Well, that's kind of special, and even in PSL2R, if you think about um, I think various people have talked about Schake groups. So in, oops, in H2, you maybe have a Schake group generated by the thing taking this circle to this circle and another element taking that circle to that circle. That's going to be a convex co-compact representation. We see the quasi-isometric embedding very naturally because you see this sort of nested picture and you see sort of one guy. So in here and then that guy dives into there and you see a nice embedding of the Cayley graph of the free group sitting right there in your picture. In fact, it's easier to somehow see than the surface group case. Um, okay, but um, you could do something really bad here, which is, or not, it's not so much bad as not convex co-compact, is what happens if you let the circles touch? So I'm an old school guy. I don't call this a Schottky group. I know a lot of people do. <laughs> this is a limit of Schottky groups in my, in my world. Um, and this group is still, the group generated by those two transformations is still discrete and faithful, but it's no longer convex co-compact. Why, no, why is it no longer uh, convex co-compact? Well, if you look at what the, what does the orbit of this element do? Now this element, um, so if you take x naught here, this is going to be a parabolic transformation. It preserves a horror cycle. And as you sort of, what happens as you go along a horror cycle, as you make linear progress along the horror cycle, well, if you go inside, if you go n along the boundary of the horror cycle, you go log n along the horror cycle. And we have to make definite linear progress. 
And log n is not definite linear progress. Okay, so this is, a lot of us are more comfortable with this calculation if you see it done with the horrible being based at infinity, right? So this is, so there's x naught, there's x naught plus one, and you go all the way out to x naught plus n. This distance is really about log n. Okay, so it's not making linear progress. So it's not in general true that a limit of quasi-isometric embeddings is a quasi-isometric embedding. Before we got a st sort of away from it, got away with it, because it is true that the limit of discrete faithful things is discrete faithful, and a discrete faithful representation of a closed surface group is always a quasi-isometric embedding. So we sort of we sort of won there. Um, just because we got lucky. So in general, this will not be an entire component. So if you're trying to generalize Teichner space, that might kind of um, worry you a little bit, but that's something you've got to live with. And um, another thing you might see is discrete faithful representations need not be convex co-compact. We also saw that. We saw that in this example. Um, and... Uh, and if you look up and you say you go from PSLR to PSL2C, things get even worse. If you look at the set of discrete faithful representations of a surface group into PSL2C, that's, that is a closed subset by the Margulis lemma um, whose interior is the set of convex co-compact representations. Well, so far that doesn't seem so bad, but that set is not even locally connected. Okay, and this is a result of... Um, Ken Bromberg and Aaron Magan. So, so things get kind of bad. But nonetheless, we persevere. Um, so let's see another way of deforming representations in the rank one setting. So let's, how would we actually build a deformation of a closed surface group into PSL2C? Well, one thing I can do is here's H2 sitting inside H3. Right, here's H2. That's sitting inside the big guy's H3. So an isometry of H2 extends to an isometry of H3, and all's well and good. But that's not... So I can get a representation into PSL2C just by looking at PSL2R as a subset of PSL2C. That's not so interesting. Right? So I want to get a representation which actually deforms away. So one thing you might do is you're on your surface here. And you take a curve C, and that curve C divides your surface into two pieces, S0 and S1. And you might say, now if I look above this up in H2, What's the pre-image of that closed GD sick? It's a bunch of, it's infinitely many of these GD sicks. And what I might do is I might say I'm going to take H2, and I want to stick H2 inside H3. And I'm going to first do, I'm going to take this piece here and stick it in inside that plane. So this is x naught, maybe over here is this piece is x1. But what am I going to do? Now I'm going to bend a small angle theta. So I'm going to come over here, and there's my angle theta, and I'm going to stick x1 in that plane. And then when I come over here, I've got to bend another angle theta. And I keep going, and I keep going, and I keep going. And since my original representation was discrete faithful, if I bend a very small amount, that's going to remain a quasi-isometric embedding. So it's going to remain convex co-compact. And you can also see what this, you can also see this sort of at the level of the limit set. You're going to see, first you saw, at first approximation you saw that circle, but now you bent it at angle there, but then you come over here and you erase this little segment and you bend it in angle theta and you get one of these quasi-circles that Pepe was talking about, right? Just by, you iterate this nasty construction, and its uh, Hausdorff dimension is no longer even one. So it's, it's become infinite length. It's not, you know, it's become a pretty bad set pretty quickly. Okay. Um, so this is a way to, geometrically, let's think about what, what is going on algebraically. 
Well, I take my Fuchsian representation, and I have one representation restricted to the fundamental group of this piece, and another representation which is restricted to the fundamental group of this piece. And now I take this axis here, call it L, and I look at a rotation by a small angle theta. Okay? And what I'm doing is I on, on S naught, I'm embed, I'm going to take my representation just to agree with the original representation rho, and on S1, it's the new representation, which is I conjugate by this rotation. And the key fact here is that R theta commutes with rho of pi 1 of C. It's in the centralizer of pi 1 of C. That's the key part of this construction. So algebraic, so I could have I could have started, I could just have written this down, except we wouldn't have really known what it meant. <laughs> and hopefully we have some picture of what it means now. And so by stability, pi rho theta will become convex co-compact for small theta, but eventually it won't be discrete faithful. If you think about it, because what happens if you go all the way around to pi? Well, then, you get a, then your representation is back into PSL2R, but it's what its volume, the volume of that representation is zero. Right? This is exactly the sort of picture that Bertrand was talking about because we have built, in fact, what we have built is a pre-geometrization with volume zero, right? There's, there's different ways of seeing this, but um, since he talked about that way. So somewhere in the middle, you hit a non-discrete, non-faithful representation. Um, okay. Okay, so a, a key feature of uh, these convex co-compact convex co-compact representations is you have what's called a limit map. So when I was building this limit set, this limit set is it's it's a quasi circle, but the key thing is a circle. It's an image of the circle, and we can think of if we think of the surface group as essentially H two. We can think of the boundary of the surface group as being a circle. And so this is an embedding of the boundary of the surface group inside of the boundary of H3. Okay? And that's the whole idea of a limit map. That always comes as part of this picture. Or when we do one of these Schottky groups constructions, you get an embedding of the Cantor set inside of the boundary of your space that you're doing the Schottky group construction on. Okay? Um, so, more generally, um, so very quick course on what a boundary is. So, if you have a proper GD symmetric space, that just means that you know closed balls are compact. Closed balls of any diameter about any point are compact, and it means that the distance between any points is exactly the length of the shortest path between those points. That's what a proper geodesic metric space is. And it's hyperbolic if any geodesic triangle is delta thin. So that you always see this very non-Euclidean picture that no matter how you draw a triangle with three sides, that the third side is within distance delta of the first two sides. Okay, so why does hyperbolic space have this property? Because if that weren't true, if this got more than delta, from those two sides, then its area would have to get big, right? Because then I would have, this point was more than delta from the other two sides, I would have embedded delta ball. And the area of a delta ball is at least, well, it's bigger than the area of Euclidean delta ball, so it's growing, it's growing faster than delta squared. <laughs> so right away we know that there must be some, and this same argument works in the hyperbolic space of any dimension, and it works whenever you have curvature bounds by sort of comparison theorems. So this is a um, very general notion. And then if, whenever you have a hyperbolic space, you can talk about the set of equivalence classes of GD sig ray. So, you tick, so if you think about what should the boundary of H2 be, morally I pick a base point and I look at all the GD sig rays emanating from that point. And then that space of geodesic rays is a nat naturally all the directions to go to infinity. Well, but if you think about, um, you know, something like the uh, uh, Cayley graph of a closed surface, there's going to be 
lots of things which go halfway around an octagon and then keep going. And they're going to be closed GD6 which go in the same direction, but they're different. So we're going to have to, in general, say two GD6 rays are equivalent if they stay near each other the whole, for, for their entire life. So the set of all equivalence classes of GD6 rays is the boundary. And there's a general property that if you have a quasi uh, isometry, then you get a map from the boundary to the boundary. And the basic idea is that you, if quasi-tometry takes a GD6 ray to a quasi-GD6 ray, remember I told you that GD6, uh, sort of quasi-GD6 live near GD6. Well, this is also true. Quasi-GD6 rays sort of track GD6 rays. Um, so you get a well-defined map of the boundaries whenever you have a quasi-isometric embedding. And so right away from that fact, you get that whenever you have um, a, a convex co-compact representation of a hyperbolic group into a rank one Lie group, then you get an embedding of its boundary into the boundary of the hyperbolic space, which G is the isometry group of. OK. So this is now a pretty sort of flexible notion. And this sort of limit map is something that we, we care a lot about. And so the goal of higher Teichmuth theory is to take this theory and start dealing with representations into general semi-simple Lie groups of higher rank. Um, so like, let's just say PSLNR for, for the moment. But you know, for instance, uh, Pepe, was, his talk was about PSLNC, which is also when n is bigger than at least, when n is at least 3 is another higher rank Lie group. Um, well, why not just use the original definition? Well, the problem with the original definition is we want the stability property. So we, we could say, I'm just going to study representations in the higher rank Lie groups so that the orbit maps are quasi-isometric embedding. So, so if you have a PSLNR, you can, in general, mod out PSLNR. Oh, okay, is it supposed to be n or n minus 1? And that gives you uh, a, what's called a, a, a symmetric space, this quotient. And this is a manifold of non-positive curvature. And then we identify PSLNR with the group of orientation-preserving isometries of x. Maybe call that xn. And so then given a representation rho from gamma into PSLNR, then we get an orbit map tau rho from gamma into Xn. And we might say, OK, I'm just going to study quasi-isometric embeddings. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, in some sense, there's nothing wrong with that. But it, it doesn't have some of the features we want. And the first one that fails is the stability. We would like to say that a good representation should sort of be, a good notion of a nice representation should be stable. And that we, if we wiggle the representation a little bit, it should still have that property. Um, and this fails right away because quasi-isometric embeddings, if you wiggle a quasi-isometric embedding into Euclidean space, it could, you know, if you wiggle, if you wiggle a line, you could all of a sudden find yourself having a circle. <laughs> Um, and so, in fact, and so if you think about this, another way to say this is, you, is that a translation occurs as a limit of rotations. So if you have a translation, z goes to z plus 1, say, and then you just take, you know, bigger and bigger circles, and you rotate by an amount so that, you know, this is 1. So this is really near 1. You rotate that angle. And if you look at, if you let those circles have bigger and bigger radius, then those rotations will converge to a translation. And clearly, these representations which take z to a rotation are not nice representations. And in the limit, you get a translation, which is a perfectly nice representation. So you've got some stability problems. And moreover, uh, Olivier Guichard jumped this up a little bit. And he can construct representations um, from the free group on two generators into PSL2R cross PSL2R, which we could stick inside PSL4R if we wanted to. And, and you get a limit map 
of the free group onto H2 cross H2. This is a quasi-isometric embedding, yet it's a limit of non-faithful representations. Okay, so that's that says that even if we sort of we saw a lot of a lot of times with even in the rank world, rank one world, you know, representations of Z are quite different than representations of a of a bigger free group. They're they're special. We call those elementary because, you know, a lot of a lot of things don't quite work. So this is a uh, non-elementary representation which still has this bad lack of stability. Okay. Okay, so let's construct some let's construct some representations. Let's just uh, think about some examples of representations we might like to handle and which we might like to think of as nice representations. So um, one class of representations is we can now think of, and this is um, this occurred in a couple talks. Think of the isometry group of H two not as PSL two R, but think of S, of it as SO two one. And then from that point of view, it sits, it sits inside PSL3R. And you can think of it as uh, a group of automorphisms preserving a disk inside RP2 from this viewpoint. So you can think of uh, PSL3R as the group of projective automorphisms of the projective plane. And then you can think of there's some nice round disk sitting within the protective tip plane, which is a copy of H2, which is preserved by your representation. And that quotient object, you could think of it as either a hyperbolic surface or as what's called a real projective surface. It's a quotient of a domain in projective space by projective automorphisms, right? I mean, a hyperbolic surface is a quotient of hyperbolic space by hyperbolic automorphisms. So you could generalize this idea. And we could also generalize our bending construction. So we again take this same picture where we divide a surface up into two pieces. And now I just, again, I take a one parameter family in the centralizer of, oh, that should be the centralizer of rho of rho naught of pi 1c. Okay? And then we can define a new representation where every time we hit C, we conjugate by something really near the identity which, which centralizes rho of pi 1 of c. So algebraically, it's the exact same construction. And geometrically, it's doing something different. It's not bending. It's um, Some people like to call this bulging. Bill Golden likes to call this the bulging operation or instead of projective bending. But you can sort of think of. So let me draw the projective plane like it's a sphere. That doesn't seem so good. But here's some disk. This is sort of the disk, which we think of as our, our projective model for hyperbolic space sitting inside RP2. So, so maybe I should erase this and have identifications there so it really looks like RP2. And then when I wiggle my representation, I now I look at the image of C is going to be a bunch of copies of lines. And then every time I hit C, I'm going to bulge out a little bit and replace it by something different and iterate it. What, what does it mean, bulge? Uh, why bulging? Does anyone have a good like, piece of intuition for why, why bulging is the right word? Bill Goldman calls it bulging. Um, I think because it's not bending. You're not bending along an angle. You're sort of shearing and I don't know. Yeah. This is not something I do for a living. <laughs> I'm faking it here. <laughs> but yeah. Nobody wants to help me? No, no, one, no one's going to help me. I think you need some kind of work. Right, right. So it's a bulge, yeah. That's true. I think, yeah, I think that's it. The point is that when you're doing this constructions, these are ellipsoids rather than circles, so they're bulgy. But yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It's a little. OK, anyway. So you can, you can do this exact same construction whenever you have a co-compact group 
uh, co-compact group of isometries of hyperbolic n space, and you have an embedded totally geodesic submanifold. You can sort of just every time you hit this, you sort of decompose the manifold along the submanifold. Every time you hit the submanifold, you do this bulging operation, or you conjugate by something preserving the plane. Okay, so what Benoit proved is that when you do this, each of these deformations is the holonomy of a convex projective structure. And so what he shows is that this bulging operation that I was drawing here, you end up with a convex subset of a projective plane, which is preserved by this uh, group of automorphisms. So I can quotient out by it, and I get a so-called convex projective surface. And so this is... Um, sort of amazing. The really, the really amazing. Well, the fact that this works for small values of t is just. We should have thought that was going to be true. The amazing thing is that it works for all values of t. You can bulge as mo much as you want, <laughs> and it will still remain a convex projective structure. I think that that's more surprising. Um, and in fact, he showed that this entire component consists of these convex projective structures. So these are, these are sometimes called Benoit components. I'm not sure they're called Benoit components by anybody but me, my co-authors, but <laughs> I think it's a good name. Okay. And so he also proved that the, the result of this bulging procedure, you get some nice C1 boundary. So it's quite different than we, when we did this operation in the Fuchsian setting and we did the bending, we ended up with something horribly not C1. It's not even Hausdorff dimension one, not even rectifiable. When you do this... In the projective setting, you get something which is, uh, which is C1 and is a rather nice object and convex. Okay? And then another first class of representations that people started thinking about was the so-called Hitchin representations. And so Hitchin, you know, at least to me, this did, when I first learned about this, didn't seem like a very promising construction to find anything interesting, but I guess that's why I'm me and Hitchens Hitchin, um, is so you take, there's an irreducible representation of PSL2R and of PSLNR, which is unique up to conjugacy, and it comes from regarding Rn as the vector space of degree n minus 1 homogeneous polynomials and two variables, and then you just, if you have a thing, I uh, have a, uh, element of PSL2R, A, B, C, D, you just take X to A, X plus B, Y, and Y to C, X plus D, Y, and then you can sort of see what that does to an automorphism, and it turns out to give you a linear transformation. So I did an example here. You can just write it down, what a diagonal matrix does, and you see that the image of a diagonal matrix is represented by this diagonal matrix. So the nice thing about this is this is diagonalizable with distinct eigenvalues. So if you take anything in PSL2R, which is a hyperbolic element, then it's going to be conjugate to that guy. So its image it, it's going to be conjugate. It's, it's going to be conjugate to this guy. So its image is conjugate to this guy, which means it's also diagonalizable with distinct eigenvalues. So that means, well, I mean it's pretty nice. It's irreducible. It's various things. Okay, and then what you might do is take a Fuchsian <laughs> representation into PSL2R and then post-compose it with this irreducible representation and end up in PSLNR. Well, then you just get a copy of Teichmuller space sitting inside the representation variety. And what Hitchin says is let's look at the component of the representation variety given by, which contains the image of the, of the, of the Teichmuller space. Okay. Okay, and that's called the Hitchin component. He used an analytic techniques to show that this is topologically a cell. So topologically, it's R n squared minus 1 times 2g minus 2, which you see when n is equal to 2, this does give you R 6g minus 6, which is good. Um, and he called this the Teichmuller component. Um, and the main evidence for this being, th for this fact being this uh, topological fact that this component happened to be a cell. Okay? And then you might ask yourself, why is that an uh, interesting component? Well, one piece of evidence for it is that if you um, look at when n equals 3, the representative PSL3R, this is just the same thing as the Benoit component. 
So this corresponds to spaces of convex, holonomies of convex projective structures on surfaces when n is 3. But in general, very little was known about what the geometric nature of these representations were, which is sort of where Anasov representations got their birth. It was Francois Labrie's attempt to, to understand these so-called Hitchin representations, which gave birth to the theory of Anasov representations. OK. Where are we time-wise? OK, so now I'm going to attempt to tell you, now I'm about maybe halfway through the talk. <laughs> so, um, so let's think about what an Anasov, let's see if we can try to get a definition of what an Anasov, trans, uh, an Anasov um, representation is, at least in a fairly simple setting. So for one thing, to get the original definition, we have to think about the geodesic flow of a group. So let's just imagine our group is the fundamental group of a closed negatively curved manifold. And then the geodesic flow of the group is just the geodesic flow of that manifold. Um, then um, one can think about, so if you have a, the geodesic flow of a negatively curved manifold, So here's your, our negative curved manifold is just going to be a surface for the moment. And then we take the universal cover to be H2. And the geodesic flow on, on the surface is you know, the spa your space of all unit tangent vectors at every point. How might we think about that? Well, a unit tangent vector is determined by, I take, two, I take the geodesic it lies on, my lift up here, in T1 of H2, well, I can think of a point which is in S1 cross S1 minus the diagonal, and that's going to give me a, a geodesic. And then I say, well, how far along am I on the geodesic? So I cross it with R. This is the so-called hop parameterization of the uh, geodesic flow of H2. And so there's various ways you might do this, but one canonical thing you might do is take x naught, and I'm going to take the point on that geodesic, which is closest to x naught, and that tangent vector, v, that's the point. So what I've drawn is v there is now the point x, y, 0. And then you know, depending on how you want to do this, you travel t along here. That's x, y, t, or it's x, y, minus t. I always get confused about that myself, in fact, and get myself in trouble. OK. So the nice property that uh, the unit the, the geodesic flow on negative curve manifold has is that it's a Nossoff, which is sort of what gives the representations their names. There's going to be sort of an Nossoff property associated to them, uh, which means that if you take the uh, tangent space to T1 of M, and you, you can split it into three pieces. Well, one piece, piece is the direction and the direction of the flow. And of course, nothing much is happening on that direction. But then you have two other directions, one direction which is being contracted and one direction which is being expanded. This is basic Anasov dynamics. And you can sort of see that in H2, so if you're at a point V here, you just draw so that's your point V. And now if you draw the Hora cycle through Y, and you look at those, that family of tangent vectors, that gives you a segment of tangent vectors. And what's happening when you flow? They're getting contracted. They're getting closer to each other. And you see if you lift upstairs and you take that segment uh, in T1 of H2, and you take the tangent space to T1 of H2, the tangent space to that segment within T1 of H2, that's going to give you V minus or V plus, whichever. OK. OK. So the key thing, or at least for um, the original definition of a Nossov representation, is the existence of limit maps. Okay. And so where do these limit maps go? 
So you start with rho from gamma into PSLNR, and you want to say, where should the limit maps be? And it turns out, well, there's various, there's a lot of different places the limit maps might go, but we're going to talk about projective and Ossoff transformations, and if we do those, the limit maps are going to go from the boundary of the group into RPN minus 1, and you have another limit map from the boundary of group into the Grassmannian of all n minus 1 dimensional hyperplanes in Rn. So in general, they'll go, these maps will go into partial flag varieties. So you can think of this as the space of lines. This is the space of n minus 1 planes. They're both partial flag varieties. So depending on what kind, what flavor of Anasov you want, they're going to go into different partial flag varieties. Okay. So you're going to require that these maps be continuous. You want them to be equivariant. And then you also want them to be transverse, which means that psi rho of x directs some theta rho of y is all of Rn if x does not equal to y. And I write it this way because this generalizes as well, but what does this mean? This guy's a line. This is a hyperplane. That just means the line doesn't line the hyperplane, right? <laughs> so, the image, so the image of any line doesn't line the image of the hyperplane associated to a different point. Okay? Okay, so uh, what would it mean to have limit maps of this type? Well, in the rank one setting, this is enough right away to generate to, to say you're discrete faithful, in fact, if you think about it. But let me not go into that. Um, but what does this tell you here? So let's make a sort of simplifying assumption. Suppose that you look at the image of this limit map, and it sort of spans Rn which means you take all the vectors in the image of the limit map. There's uncountably many of them, of course, but you just look at what they span. Either they span some vector space, and if they span all of Rn, well, what does this row equivariance tell you? Well, you know that the action of the group on its boundary has a lot of hyperbolic dynamics. In particular, if you look at the action of a, of a one element on its boundary, uh, it has two fixed points, gamma plus and gamma minus, and everything except gamma minus is being sucked into gamma plus when you hit it with larger and larger, larger powers of gamma, and then when you hit it, and then on, on the other side, everything but gamma plus is being sucked down into gamma minus when you hit it by larger and larger negative powers of gamma. So you have these north-south dynamics, and so if the, by the equivariance, these north-south dynamics live on the image of this limit map. Right, because this is a homeom equivariant homeomorphism. So you have north-south dynamics on the image of the limit map. Well, what does that mean? That means that if you look at rho of the attracting fixed point of gamma, since everything in the boundary of the group is getting sucked into gamma plus, that means that everything <laughs> on, the, on this limit map is being sucked into gamma plus. But this is a linear map, so that means that it's action on, on the projective plane has an attracting fixed point. Well, what does that mean? That means your matrix is, pro that means your uh, linear transformation is proximal, right? It has a unique eigenline of maximal modulus, and that eigenvalue is real, right? If you think just about what the Jordan decomposition looks like, if you, if you look at your Jordan decomposition, and if you're if you have two fixed points of equal eigenvalue, then you're going to get everything of two fixed points of equal eigenvalue, and those are both the highest eigenvalue, then you're going to get everything's going to be attracted not to a point, but to a line. So, okay. And moreover, since you see the same thing for gamma inverse, you notice that every element is in fact biproximal, which means there's a unique top eigenvalue of maximum modulus 
and a unique bottom eigenvalue of minimal mod modulus. So right away, we already know a lot about our representation. And in fact, um, this assumption we're making is equivalent to the representation being irreducible, meaning that the, that the group doesn't preserve any vector subspace. And there's a theorem of guichard wienhard that if you're an irreducible representation, just the existence of limit maps makes you projective in Ossoff. But in general, we need to add a little bit more. Ooh, OK, I better stop. So um, I was about to uh, yeah, do all the scary stuff, like tell you what a flat bundle was and tell you what a flow parallel to a flat connection is. But maybe I will do that tomorrow.